Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus again today. I am Trace and this is episode three of four about my trip to the LHC and to CERN on the border of France and Switzerland. One of the largest machines ever built, actually it probably is the largest machine ever built by man. It's an incredible cyclotron underneath the border of those two amazing countries. So if you don't know anything about it, make sure you go back and watch episode one of this series. And if you don't know who we're about to talk to, make sure you go check out episode two of this series. And now we're gonna have the second half of our conversation with Talika Bose, associate professor, Boston University, trigger coordinator on the CMS. What does that mean? Hopefully you know it by now, but if not, make sure you pay attention. I like what you said earlier about uh, what if we don't know to look for it, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is a, such a specialized machine based on what we understand in the standard model of physics. So outside of that model, we, we don't, this isn't set up to capture that yet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what's the plan to kind of figure that? How do you go about figuring out stuff that we don't know yet, you know? Yes, so yes, that's what keeps me up at night too, <laughs> so. Well, I'm sorry uh, to bring that up. But, <laughs> but the, uh, the point is yes, we can use our current knowledge and then, so for example, our say the most popular new physics model might say that uh, the new physics particle that you're looking for will have you know muons and electrons in the final state with very high momentum so mm -hmm. you can design your trigger to look for these specific you know criteria however what we should probably do is at the same time because we really don't know what this potentially new physics might be, also keep a small fraction of low momentum electrons and muons. Mm -hmm. And so what we have is an inclusive strategy in addition to an exclusive strategy. And in this inclusive strategy, we keep a smaller fraction of these sort of lower momentum or more generic events with the hope that in case we were not triggering directly on the new physics particle, we haven't thrown it away completely. And when analyzing the data in more clever ways, we might be able to identify this. Got it. So there's so much going on there that the trigger is sort of saying, well, these ones we understand. This is, this is a white bread interaction. But this one over here, this is something special. This is maybe something we, have, we don't see often or haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you, when you go about designing that, it just seems like there would be so much to think about, so much to, to anticipate mm -hmm. capturing. I mean, how long does it take to kind of come up with that process? Well, <laughs> originally, years and years and years, because uh, the, the trigger was the original design of the trigger, you know, almost 25 years ago. And it came about with uh, the idea that we should have, for example, a two-level trigger system, something that's going to make very quick and coarse decisions, a level one trigger, together with essentially a higher level trigger, which will make more precise uh, mm -hmm. decisions. However, it has evolved a lot as we have seen data that has been collected by other experiments. Our own experiment, for example, in the first run, we you know, learned a lot operating the detector. So now in the latest run that we've started, we've essentially used our knowledge of particle physics coming from theory, the data that has been collected previously, our simulation of what we might expect in the new run to come up with these trigger strategies. And so these trigger strategies essentially involve making you know, course de decisions requiring muons, electrons, which is all, for example, that the level one trigger can do because it has about three microseconds to make a decision to get the input rate of 40 megahertz down to about 100 kilohertz. That's a lot of, that's a lot of data right. that goes through. So it is very coarse, three microseconds, you decide literally. So you're not really measuring anything to high precision. You are not saying that the momentum of this is 9.995. You are yeah. saying, is the momentum greater than eight? Yeah. It's high, let's just keep it. <laughs> yeah. you know? and, now, and then the next filter will say, oh, is it greater than eight and also something else. That's then, right. Then we'll, okay, we're gonna keep that and then and then you just kind of put it through all of these gates. That's right, they're different, they're different sort of stages and each one you have a little bit more time so you can make a more educated decision. Yeah. And then ultimately you get your thousand events per second after this multi-step process. So how did you get to this place? So uh, I've been doing particle physics. I'm starting with my uh, graduate uh, career. And I was then working at Fermilab, uh, Fermi National Accelerator Lab outside Chicago on the D0 experiment. 
And then as a postdoc, I transitioned to working on D0, but also CMS. And that was the first time, this was back in uh, 2006, when I first uh, came to CMS. Now, this was uh, part of Brown University. The US actually has a, a huge role in both the CMS and the Atlas and actually other experiments here at the LHC. And uh, in, in particular on CMS, there are a large number of institutes, almost one third of my experiment is US based. Mm. And, and because we had essentially large contributions uh, to the trigger, essentially uh, as part of you know, US CMS uh, contributions coming from uh, the Office of Science, from uh, the DOE and NSF, uh, we were able to essentially get involved in the uh, run one, the first run of uh, the LHC. Mm -hmm. And that was my role, being able to come here, help commission the trigger for the first run. And then over the course of time, my role evolved from just helping with the commissioning to now actually, as part of Boston University, being responsible for making sure that the trigger works. Yeah, now you're, now you're kind of a big boss here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that it keeps me up more now than it did earlier, but uh, yeah. yes, it's, it's a good challenge, so I like it because it's very challenging, and I like challenges. Yeah. How did you get interested in science in the first place? I, I think it goes back to uh, school. I liked physics and math because uh, I felt I didn't have to memorize anything. All mm -hmm. I had to do was understand it, and if I understood it, then I could take care of it. And then uh, I had the uh, chance of actually going to Cambridge University in England. And there, as an undergrad, I did a research project working on an earlier generation experiment here at the CERN. And I think that was the starting point uh, of me getting really interested in particle physics. And then when it came time to choose a graduate school, uh, this was in the, in the mid 90s, exciting things were happening in the US at Fermilab. And I knew that I wanted to go to the US uh, for graduate school. And, and so then I there you are. arrived in the US and have been there for the last 20 years now. <laughs> what makes particle physics so great? Primarily, I think it's because you're really understanding the world around you, nature, you know, why, are, why do we exist today? I mean, one of the, the big questions that is facing us today is the fact that back at the Big Bang, when the universe sort of began, we had what is called equal amounts of matter and antimatter, mm -hmm. okay? Now, ideally, in principle, matter and antimatter collide and woof, everything should just, you know, collapse, annihilate. annihilate. Yeah. However, you and I exist. Yeah. We are matter. Yeah. Okay. So somehow matter persisted and existed, whereas the antimatter has just gone away, has right. disappeared. And where is it? Or why? And this is such a fundamental question to our existence that I think is one of the right. main reasons trying to understand the world around us that I find particle physics so exciting. The other big question is, for example, all of the particles, you know, we've been talking about electrons, muons, protons, etc. They constitute about, you know, five percent of sort of the uh, the visible mass in this universe. The rest of it, we actually can't see. Mm. We can only sort of infer its presence through its sort of, you know, gravitational interaction, you know, movement and mass of galaxies. This is why we call it, for example, a large part of it dark matter, mm -hmm. because it's dark, we can't, we, we see, can't it. see it. And there's another part which is responsible for the, uh, the acceleration of the universe, dark energy, because again, we don't really know its origin. And these are all such fundamental questions that we don't have an answer to. And particle physics is really trying to answer each of these questions in very, very fundamental ways. Yeah. And I, How could you not want to be part of that, yes. you know? <laughs> How cool is she, right? What an amazing job. This is like science in action. This is real science happening underneath our feet. So, so cool. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with her. Next, we're moving on to another guy who works at the LHC, not at the experiments on the LHC, but at the LHC itself. His name is Mike Lamont. He's the operations group leader, basically the guy that keeps the whole thing running. So make sure you subscribe so you can find out how they keep the biggest machine in the world going, because that's the guy we talk to next. Let us know down in the comments if there's anywhere else you think we should go. And thanks for watching DNews Plus.